All right, guys, in today's video, we're taking a look at this check engine light that we've got on this 2013 Chevrolet Avalanche LT. We're going to come down to our scan tool and we're going to see what that code is all about. And then go debug it. This is a four wheel drive Avalanche with the LC9 engine two speed transfer case. So let's see what we got here. All right, we got one code on the ECM. P015B, oxygen sensor, delayed response, lean to rich, bank one, sensor one. All right, so let's take a look at what that could be. Uh, this is not a code that tells you to change the O2 sensor. There's many, many causes for this code. We're going to go have to diagnose this and see what it is. We're not going to fire a parts cannon at it. So let me take you through the approach for doing that. All right, guys, let's see what the GM service manual for these SUVs has to say about this code. This is the 2013 version, but this is going to apply to any of the years I put in the video title. So we come up and take a look at this particular code. We have the uh, P015B. There's a whole host of these codes covered in this section. There's two sensors on each side. So bank one is the driver's side or where the odd numbered cylinders are. And bank two is the passenger side where the even numbered cylinders are. Sensor one is in front of the catalytic converter and sensor two is behind the catalytic converter. If I flip back over here to a little diagram, you can see this a little easier. This is the driver's side, this is the passenger side. These are the two catalytic converters. You've got a sensor plugged in here. This is going to be sensor one, and then the one afterwards is sensor two. This is bank one, this is bank two. They're just showing two in this picture because there can be two different types for this particular application. So when we look at our code, it's 15B, which is a delayed response going from lean to rich on bank one, sensor one. So driver's side or left-hand side in front of the catalytic converter. The sister code for this one would be 15D, which is the exact same code, but on bank two, sensor one, which is on the passenger side. If we take a look at what it takes to set this code, 15B and D, Besides not having any of these other codes present, it's pretty simple. Certain voltage, certain fuel levels, certain run time, certain speed on the engine RPM, certain speed on the vehicle, certain amount of air moving through the MAF sensor, and then it checks it once per ignition cycle. In fact, this code can be intermittent and can clear. The computer will clear this code if it passes on the fourth ignition cycle. So you'll see the check engine light come and go. If we take a look at some of the diagnostics for this, what we can see over here on the circuit and system verification, uh, opening up the hood to disable the auto stop, verifying that the hood's open and making sure you have no other codes. Uh, we already did that. As you saw, we only had the one code. There are no other codes present, so we don't need to worry about diagnosing if this is a problem. And then that leaves us with this list right here. Now, if I grab a copy of this so we can write on it, and take a look at that. Lean or rich fuel injectors, water intrusion on the oxygen sensor harness, lower high fuel system pressure, fuel that's contaminated, fuel saturation of the EVAP canister, exhaust leaks near the O2 sensor, engine vacuum leaks, engine oil consumption, which, which LC9 5.3 liter isn't consuming oil by this age, or engine coolant consumption. If it's none of these, then you replace the sensor. So we can eliminate some of these right off the bat. So it's not engine coolant consumption for two reasons. One, this has had no coolant added to it and it's not anything low. And if it was a coolant consumption problem, it would not just be on one side. We can also eliminate vac engine exhaust leaks, although we're going to have to go do that. So I'm going to go ahead and, and say that we're inspecting this one. So this is not necessarily um, confirmed yet, but we can easily eliminate this one. We can also eliminate fuel that is contaminated for two reasons, actually three reasons. One, if it was a contaminated fuel, it wouldn't just be a code on the driver's side, it would be on the passenger side too, so you'd have 15B and a 15D. 
And this is always getting tier one gas in this particular engine, or this particular vehicle rather. And this is not happening right after a fill up. This is happening three quarters of a way through a fill up for the first time. So I don't believe that there's a possibility for this to be a problem. Water intrusion on the harness is easy enough to eliminate so we can check that one. So that's gonna leave us with injectors or fuel pressure. Fuel saturation of the EVAP canister. This is when you overfill when you're adding fuel and it can overflow into this canister. This is also something we can check, but it's highly unlikely, but we are able to check that. We know that we got engine oil consumption with this particular engine. So I think what we're gonna end up with is just this is the one problem, but let's go ahead and, and take a look at the procedure for removing this if we end up having to do it because we're gonna need to get in there to do some of these checks anyway. So looking at this replacement of bank one sensor one on a 1500, um, they talk about raising the vehicle and doing all this. I'm going to tell you, you don't need to do any of this. I'm going to show you how you can access this through the wheel well. Um, they talk about disconnecting the harness. Definitely going to have to do that. The clip on the f the clip um, that's holding it, and and disconnecting it there. So that's all you're going to have to do is these lower steps. Let me go show you what that looks like. So again, we're after the one that's installed here. All right, so to get access to do the exhaust leak inspection, as well as to get an eye at sensor one, we're going to need to take out this inner wheel well liner, this plastic wheel well liner. And it's attached with several of these push pins. And then there are a few seven millimeter screws. There's two seven millimeter screws here on the aft side. And then on the forward side, there's a seven millimeter here. There might be another one down below that I can't see. I'm not going to show you all of this, but I'll show you getting one of these out just so you can see what you need to do. So you're going to need a trim tool, something like this or something like this. And the way these particular pins work, there's usually a little indentation where you can start to get the tool in. If they haven't been out in a while, they're going to be really stiff, but you want to work the tool underneath and then the center piece, when you get it in the right spot, it's going to push out. These are definitely never been off. If they've never been off, they can be real stubborn. There we go. Once we get this guy to come up part way, then we go up underneath the base and we pull it out of the hole. They, and they, they can come apart, that's okay. Right, and so the way this thing works is this guy fits in here and as you push him in, he spreads it out and that's what holds everything. So you're gonna go ahead and identify all of these. There's some on the perimeter here. There's also a couple more inbound, one right here. And you guys can't see it very well, but there's one right here as well. There's probably there's another one here along the top. Just find all these and pull it out. Don't worry about what you see, these Christmas tree connectors protruding in from the inside. We're not going to remove this. We're just going to pull it down so we can see right behind where my finger is. Right behind there is where this sensor is. All right, guys, you want to get it to a point like this where it's loose and flappy on this back side. You don't need to worry about the front side, just enough on the top so we got some movement. And like I said, don't worry about all of these push pins coming through from these wiring harness retainers. You're not going to be able to push them back on and take them off. Is it going to help anything? This is just to get you where you can see that sensor. It's not like you can actually get in here and remove it from this side. This is just where we can see, right? So looking at this kind of block of, of uh, pipes here, and then right past that, that would be the sensor. I'm trying not to have the flashlight wash it out, but if we zoom in right there, are we able to zoom in anymore? Let's see, oh, that's it right there where I'm putting the light. That's the sensor, so you can see it faces the engine. So you can't access it any other way except from underneath the vehicle. But I wanted to have you see it from this angle. Now, what else can we do from this view? Well, the other thing we can do from this view is up above here. I don't know if we can get the camera where you can see. But up above here is our exhaust flange right there. And so we'll be able to check 
the nuts on the exhaust flange to make sure that they're all there. And we can also be able to see if there's any evidence of an exhaust leak at this exhaust flange. Now I'm going to go up above under the hood and we'll take a look at the exhaust manifold and then we'll go underneath and look at the actual sensor. All right, first thing we're going to do is we're going to make sure that all of the bolt heads are present on the driver's side exhaust manifold. It's a pretty easy, simple visual inspection that could lead to an exhaust leak. You should be able to hear something like this, but not always. Take an inspection mirror. We can go back. It's typically this guy on the back here that goes, but that one's still there. We'll go underneath and we can check the rest of the bolts that are up on this manifold part of the exhaust system and then we can also inspect the wiring harness from underneath. Alright guys from underneath this is bank one sensor two and then right up above is the harness from bank one sensor one. And If we follow that lead around here past the catalytic converter there is the guy that is throwing the code right there. So you have to come at it from under here. Now, we can also, from this angle, although our flashlight is just not exactly in the right spot, let me move that, we can also get another view of these flange nuts, and we can also inspect that they're all there. And what we're looking for is any signs of exhaust leakage and soot. We're also going to be looking at the bung that this sensor plugs into. We want to see if we see any signs of the weld cracking or exhaust leaks happening there. And we can confirm between what we looked at above with the exhaust manifold and what we see here, as well as the third nut that you guys can't see that's in the kind of like way under here. I've already checked it. We don't have any exhaust leaks happening. So we can cross that cause off of our list as well. So now we can probably just go ahead and proceed to take this sensor off and take a look at its condition. It's going to be really hard to film up here. So what I'm going to actually do is I'm going to show you the tool and we'll just go ahead and take sensor 2 off just to show you the technique for removing them. It's just easier to film that way. All right, guys, we're going to come in. I got a tool here from Lyle. There's a number of different brands. I'll link this one down in the description. But basically what you got is the socket has a slit in it so you can get the wiring harness to go through it like this. I'm doing this blind so I don't block the camera. We may have to do a couple of shots at this because I don't know if I have enough leverage in this position, but we'll try to do it with you guys watching. Let's see if we can get this guy off. Ah, there he goes. All right. They get anti seize put on them at the factory. As long as that's always put on there, it's usually just a matter of breaking the torque. And we're crimping up the harness to get it off. All right, hopefully you guys can see, I just set the camera next to me. There's a little green safety tab here. We got to pull this guy out so that we can release the wiring harness. So I can one hand that. There we go. And then with that out of the way, it's just a simple lift up and push type. And that gets our harness off right there. All right, after you get that wiring harness retaining clip disconnected, like I showed you on the other harness, on this guy, it's a female connector rather than a male. And we're going to have to pry the Christmas tree connector off the retaining tab here in order to get it to let go. So you just have to work a trim tool in here. I'm using the plastic one, but anything you can fit in here will be fine. All right, guys. So we now can say there's no water intrusion on the wiring harness, and there's no exhaust leak near that bank one sensor one. So that leaves, and we know there is engine oil consumption, that leaves vacuum leaks, fuel saturation, lower high fuel pressure, or lean or rich fuel injectors. Well, we can eliminate this one because... If we had a fuel pressure problem, it wouldn't just affect one bank. It would affect both banks, and we only have a code on one side. So we don't have this problem, in my opinion. Now, we could still have a problem with an injector. We could still have a fuel saturation of the EVAP canister, although it's very unlikely. 
we would have to pull it down to verify that. Or we could still have a vacuum leak. However, a vacuum leak, I would expect to throw some other type of code. And a fuel injector problem, I would expect there to be a misfire. So what we can do to eliminate this one is we can hook the Tech 2 back up and we can see if we have any misfire data. All right, guys, we don't need to run the engine for what I'm going to check here. We're going to go into data display and we're going to go down and find the misfire data. And what I'm interested in is misfire history. So if the engine was running, it would track the currents here. Here's our history. So no misfires, well, two on seven. So out of all eight cylinders, and for whatever period of time the history goes back to, we've only had a total of two misfires on cylinder seven. So that tells me that I really don't suspect any problem on bank one with cylinders one, three, and five. And seven, to have two misfires over a very long period of time with an engine that burns oil like these LC9s. I also am not suspecting fuel injectors here. All right, what about vacuum leaks? Well, for vacuum leaks, we're going to have to take a look at the engine. It's going to be visual inspection also. We're going to need to get this decorative cover off. It's like two little uh, push pin type connectors I'll show you in a minute. And then in the back, there's like two little friction fitting pieces. Sometimes helps to get these hoses out of the way. The coolant hoses out of the way and then just kind of pull her forward. Get out of there. All right. So yeah, what you got here, you got a couple of rubber grommets. And then you got a couple of clasps. These two studs fit in the rubber grommets. And then these guys in the back clasp on to those hinge pieces. So for vacuum leaks, what we're looking for, there's a hose. I guess we'll start on this side. There's a hose here. We're going to make sure this hose is connected, not broken. We're going to go travel over the top. And that's what this inspection is. We're looking for hoses that are of a vacuum nature. Now these should be throwing other codes. Here's another one up on top. But since the service manual says this is part of the check, that's what we're going to do. We're going to follow this hose down in the back here. can't show you right here on the camera. We're going to follow this hose here down. We're going to make sure that there's no damage to any of these hoses. If we see any other hoses connecting up to the intake manifold, like you got this guy coming to the power brake booster, this guy right here, that's another hose that we're going to want to get an inspection mirror back here and make sure it's not damaged and connecting to the back. I'm pretty sure this is not the problem. I'll go ahead and get the mirror and check the back side that we can't see from here. But I think we can cross this off our list of potential causes for this code. All right, so I'm going to cross off fuel injectors as a potential cause. Now, if I decided to go test that one with the two misfires and I came over to this section, we could use the Tech 2 to command the fuel pump relay on and we could run what's called a fuel injector balance test with the scan tool. So we could certainly go in and do that. I do not suspect it. We would have other symptoms in my opinion. We can always go do that later. I'm going to go ahead and call this one unlikely though since it's a simple test though we could run it later if we still experience this code. But that does is brings us back to the list and where are we at? Well through process of elimination the only other thing we could really go check is fuel saturation of this evap canister. I am really not expecting that to have anything to do with this, quite frankly. There's even a, um, a you know, possibility of, of things that aren't in this list, but this is all GM has you check. So I'm satisfied that we've gone enough to finally go ahead and replace the sensor. At least we've gone through and made an effort to look for anything else that might be causing this to avoid this happening again after we put such an expensive part on. Let's go ahead and pull that sensor off and take a look at it. All right, what if we wanted to take a look at that EVAP canister to see if it's saturated with fuel and how does it get saturated with fuel? So right now we're underneath the vehicle right below where the fuel filler access is. This is where you'd pump in your gas right behind that cap. And then this is the main pipe that delivers the fuel into the fuel tank. And right next to it is a smaller hose. And if we follow that back up towards where you put the fuel nozzle in, you'll see there's a little clamp and it's attached right there. 
And so what happens is if you put too much fuel in, like when the fuel auto stops and you keep trying to manually keep trying to put more in, it can overflow and go down that pipe and it'll end up in this canister. So let me show you that canister. So that's how it happens. Let's go take a look at that canister and see if there's a problem. All right, so if you follow that vent hose, it'll go all the way over the spare tire. It'll loop down and it'll come up into this guy right here. So this is your EVAP canister. It's full of activated charcoal and it's an emission control device. And so like I was saying, if you overfill the fuel and you get fuel going back to that vent hose, it can end up getting inside here and if you do it too often, it won't be able to get out. And then those vapors could then end up getting pulled into the engine too rich because you've saturated this and be a cause for that code that we're looking at. Now, to check this, you'd have to get up here, disconnect everything, and pull it out. We know from the owner history in this case that the owner never tries to put more fuel in. Once the fuel auto shuts off, they leave it alone, and that's what you want to do. But if you don't know the owner history, or you think the owner has been doing that, then you'll definitely want to inspect this right, guy. Because this is a four-wheel drive truck, this is the setup that we'll use to crack the torque on that Bank 1 Sensor 1 for this particular avalanche. All right, guys. What you'll find is this guy will have a tendency to want to break off because of the awkward position it was in, like I showed you. And like I said earlier, you know, it's really hard to film doing this whole piece just because of all the obstructions and the lack of clearance. But it's going to be exactly the same technique as the Bank 1 Sensor 2 that I did show you, although they're totally different sensors and are not interchangeable. This guy, if we zoom in, still has his GM number on him. He's a 1258-3804 OEM by Denso. This is likely the original sensor from 2013. There's no obvious damage on this guy, and there's no obvious indication uh, of a problem other than you know some soot right down here at the base, but I'm not going to say that's unusual to find. There's a lot of ash, which is what you would expect to see. So what we're going to go ahead and do, now that we've done process elimination, we're going to take a look at replacing this. All right, earlier when I showed you this graphic, it showed two different sensors for this location. If you notice, one has a female connector with the little Christmas tree plug on it and the other has a male connector and that's because depending on the truck we're looking at an avalanche here but depending on the truck Escalade, Suburban, Tahoe it's a possibility for one of two different sensors to be here and these are one of the two different sensors that could be in this location so one could be a GM 1258-9321 or an AC Delco 213-3533 and what this guy looks like is he has a male connector. Other than that, he looks the same. You can see here that there's anti-seize that's been pre-applied on the thread, so make sure you don't touch that. The other number is the one we have, which is the female. And that is just like our original, a 1258-3804 or a Delco 213-3866. So that has a connector on the end like this. Otherwise, it's the same sensor. And again, the anti-seize has already been applied from the factory by GM. So what do we do to install this? Well, they, they mention about this, the need to have this anti-seize on here. And they talk about it being a special type that's constructed of liquid graphite and glass beads. So this is not a copper type of anti-seize that GM calls for here, and it's not a nickel type. It's a glass bead and graphite type. Um, if you end up pulling the sensor off like we did on Bank 1 Sensor 2 for that e example that I gave you, you end up having to put this anti-seize back on when you reinstall it. The part number they give for this is a 1237-7953, but that's long discontinued. It's been replaced by 8886-2477, and Delco doesn't even bother to rebrand this anymore. This is from Bostic never sees and this is that type of graphite and glass bead type of anti-seize you can see kind of like the little glass sparkles in it there so if you were replacing the sensor this is what you would use but the factory has already applied this so we're going to reinstall this guy it doesn't matter whether you're doing sensor one or two they all go to 31 foot pounds of torque so we're going to go ahead and reinstall him we'll reconnect the um, 
a wiring harness and then when we looked over here this CPA retainer is that little green clip that keeps it from coming undone so make sure you reconnect that little green retainer as well all right and then when we get ready to torque this guy and go back underneath I'll try to get you a shot but this is the setup we'll use we'll put our sensor socket on with a swivel 3 8 3 8 extension and then we'll have our torque wrench up on top. I'm using 3 8 because it takes up a little less space and it's very cramped as you can see. Alright guys hopefully I can get you up here to see what I'm doing. So after we get this guy torqued down we're going to route the harness up into position. I'm trying to get this in here without knocking the camera over. Nope, gonna have to move the camera, but you guys get the idea, right? You're gonna push it into that little Christmas tree bracket right there. I'm gonna seat it all the way. I gotta get the camera out of the way to get my hand up in here enough to squeeze it. And then we'll bring over the connector, snap it in, and put the green retainer back on. All right, when you get done, it's gonna look like this, fully seated with the green retainer in there securing it. All right, I figured I'd get you guys a view of torquing this down. Just going to get the tool in like this. We got a uh, swivel and an extension. 31 foot pounds. All right, guys, no particular torque on these fasteners because of plastic. Just snug them up. But we got the wheel well back installed. We didn't really need this other than for the visual aid. It's not going to help you with the tooling, although it could be a good place to put a flashlight or have a helper help spot you in. I'm going to go show you the passenger side now just in case you got the P015D code. All right, we're on the passenger side, guys. Flashlight sitting on the catalytic converter. This is bank two, sensor two right here. S gotta follow up before the converter to get to bank two, sensor one. And that's him right up there where you see me putting the flashlight. I'm not gonna turn the flashlight on because the light would wash it out. All right, guys, the best shot for the passenger side sensor is to take out the wheel well inner liner. So there's a several different push pins, and there's also some 7 millimeter fasteners. We'll need to go all the way around, remove those, we'll pull this out, and then we'll have a straight shot at the O2 sensor itself. All right, so when you get all those push pins and those 7 millimeters, you'll be able to pull this guy down. It's still going to have a wiring harness in a couple of points. You don't need to bother removing that because just pulling it down is enough to get access to this oxygen sensor and there he is right there so now we got a clear shot to taking him off if we zoom back out just a little bit and we follow the wiring harness down we can see where we disconnect it it's right down there kind of right it's kind of obscured in this view with the camera but you can see him right there so you'll be able to reach your hand down there it's a little bit of a tight fit compared to the driver's side but still doable what we'll do to go after this passenger side one with the tool is we'll get a half inch flex head ratchet. You could also use a half inch breaker bar and we'll put the tool in this orientation, give it a twist that way. That'll allow us to get this off with this wheel well out of the way. All right, now that we've got that swap done, we're just going to come in here and we're going to clear this code out. It's the only way we're going to know if this test worked. So as soon as this is done, we can have the owner take it back and they can let us know that the code's gone and that the problem is fixed. All right, guys, we got um, everything torqued down there that I showed you. We also did the same thing on the passenger side, got everything buttoned back up, got the engine started up here. There's just a few things we want to check before we take it on a test drive. I'm going to go back and take a look at that misfire data. Uh, since we've got a new ignition cycle going on here, don't expect the history to show anything. And, yep, those two on seven are gone now. But we're not seeing any active misfires. So that's just like kind of a sporadic, intermittent kind of problem. Not a direct contributor. All right, so we're going to go back to engine data, and we're going to take a look at the O2s sitting here at idle. Just a little bit further down here. There they are. 
All right, so there's the guy that we replaced. And we're just kind of comparing how he's behaving with how his sister on bank two is behaving. So what I see is both them periodically are dipping below 200 millivolts. Our new one is probably going to be a little bit more responsive than the old one on the pasture side. Seems like the lowest the pasture dips down to is 125. Our new one occasionally dips down. It's, I think I saw 80 was the lowest number it dipped down to. But they're both responding. That's what I wanted to see. And our two sensor twos are kind of hovering about equal, which is what you also want to see. All right, so at this point, we're going to take it for a test drive. We'll go ahead and monitor our fuel trims to see if we see any change. I mean, right now, short term, kind of hovering minus two or three. That's fine. Long term, slightly lean on bank one flat on bank two but we'll give it a, a run and see if anything changes there but I think at this point we're basically done guys I hope this video helped you out with some of the things you can check before just shooting straight for the sensor in this case we ended up finding that the troubleshooting tree took us to changing the sensor but we want to go through the troubleshooting tree as much as we can before going there yeah we skipped out on the evap canister but there was really no reason to suspect that and if we didn't have the oil consumption, I would have checked that specifically. But with the oil consumption, I'm pretty sure what's going to happen here with this LC9 burning oil is it's just going to shorten the life of the O2 sensors. But that's cheaper than having the owner pull the engine heads and put new piston rings in, which is the only real cure for that after AFM does its duty. All right. If you've got any questions or comments, leave them below. I'll try to help. If you found this video useful, saved you some money, and taught you how to do this repair yourself, I'd appreciate you paying it forward by hitting that like button. And as always, thanks for watching.